Voila! This calls for a new adventure! Donna the Explorer! To learn the Englishes in Japan, China, and Korea, we will be going to Japan, Korea, and China. Where are we going? To Japan? Korea? And China! first go to Japan. To get there, we need to ride an airplane. Slingbag, do we have a ticket for an airplane to Japan? Slingbag, Slingbag, yeah! Can you find our airplane ticket for Japan? There it is. Donna, we have our ticket for Japan. This is the final boarding call for Donna, flying to Japan on flight EZ-9753. Your flight is ready to leave. Please go to gate 14 immediately. The doors of the plane will close in 5 minutes. Final boarding call for Donna. in Japan. Sadly, I'm not familiar with this country. Hmm. Slingbag, who can we ask for help when we don't know which way to go? Kizzy! Hey Donna, what can I help you with today? Hey Kizzy, where is the nearest tourist attraction near me? The nearest tourist spot would be the Tokyo Bay. Oh, I see. But how are we supposed to get there? To get there, you need to ride a taxi. Thank you, Kizzy. Come on, let's ride a taxi and go to Tokyo Bay. This place looks magnificent. Kizzy, can you tell me an event that happened in this bay? Sure, Donna. Did you know that in 1853, Commodore Paris' entrance in this bay caused the Japanese people to start learning English? Oh wow, I didn't know that. Can you tell me more about Japanese English? The real opening of Japan took place after 1868 with the arrival of American missionaries who taught English at private and government schools. Japanese scholars and educators wrote about their predictions for the eventual triumph of English. Mori Arinori, who was to become the first minister of education, went so far as to call Japanese a meager language. Although Japanese was, of course, never abolished, English borrowing proceeded at a great rate, to the point that in Hepburn's 1867 dictionary, the romanization or romaji system was introduced which continues in use even today. Even during World War II? However, during World War II, the government attempted to banish English, replacing usual words as announcer or announcer with the esoteric hosoin. As soon as the war ended, however, English made its comeback. By now, because of its intimate incorporation into spoken Japanese, English has become nativized in various respects and plays an important part in the communicative strategies of the Japanese. How about its characteristics? English in Japan has both a pragmatic function and an emblematic or decorative function. The number and scope of English borrowings in Japanese is phenomenal. A loan word dictionary gave over 27,000 entries in 1977. Almost 81% of borrowed words in Japanese are from English, so that approximately 8% of the total Japanese vocabulary is derived from English. The borrowings, however, have been assimilated to conform 
to the phonological structure of the Japanese language. The following items show some examples of 1 to 4 above. The examples of 1 and 4 are from Hayashi and Hayashi 1995. The others are from Stanlaw 2004 colon 74. Stool, Suturu, Thought, Soto, Gray Zone, Gray Zone, This, Zisu, 7 Eleven, Seven Eleven, Color, Kara. Some grammatical accommodations are made, such as deriving adverbs with the postpositional particle ni, instead of the derivational affix ku which is used with native words. Nice ni, nicely. Verbs are usually constructed by adding suru, or do. Compounding is a productive process applied to or involving loans and may take several forms. For instance, hybrids are phrases containing an element from each language, as American ko, literally, American powder. The semantics of borrowed items runs the gamut from more or less literal transfer, such as goruhu and tenisu, to various sorts of changes in meaning. Semantic shifting is exemplified by items such as furonto, hotel reception desk, viking, viking, buffet, eat all you like restaurant, and echo, echo, acoustics. Shifting may range from changes of sense to redefinition. In phonology, what difference does it bear? The phonological assimilation of a large number of English items has had an impact on Japanese English. The Japanese pronunciation of these items is transferred to pronunciation of English, which results in Japanese English sounding very different from other varieties. English has also been nativized to signal specific Japanese meaning and create specific cultural effects for the Japanese audience with no regard for intelligibility with non-Japanese. Collocations such as coffee and kitchen or sandwiches and cafe and real estate slogans such as we create a bright and affluent life appeal to the Japanese sensibility. However, odd others may consider them. Uh-huh. The situation is about to change, however, with the new government policy of empowering learners with the ability to use the language in the global context, that is, cultivating Japanese with English abilities, as defined by the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology, or MEXT. The current action plan announced in March 2003 establishes a system for cultivating Japanese with English abilities in five years. The goal of English education is to make certain learners achieve certain levels of competence in spoken English at each stage of their schooling and tertiary education. The goals are defined in terms of STEP, Society for Testing English Proficiency, and the universities are expected to set their proficiency levels according to the professional requirements of the graduating population. It is specified that the goals are to be achieved by 2008. The criteria of speaking Japanesely have to do with phonology, lexis, and syntax. Lexical innovation includes outright coinage, for example, base up, or an increase in, let's say, salary level, as well as less drastic shifts of meaning or sense, for example, pick up. Speaking English Japanesely goes beyond strictly linguistic elements. It is a manner of speaking English that does not threaten the speaker nor come into conflict with this person's identity as a Japanese. That was surprisingly enlightening, Kizzy. Thank you for that. And now that I've learned Japanese English, it's time to move on to our next destination, Korea. have just arrived in Korea, and I can't wait to learn Korean English. Kizzy, where are we going? We are going to Seoul. 
But how do we get there? The fastest way to get to Seoul is by riding a taxi. Thanks, Kizzy. Come on, let's find a taxi to go to Seoul. While we are on our way to Seoul, I want to learn the history of Korean English. Kizzy, can you tell me how Korean English started? Sure, Donna. Korea came into contact with English towards the end of the 19th century. But during the Japanese occupation, the link was weakened. However, English regained and strengthened its position after the Second World War. At the end of the Korean War, in 1950 to 1953, English language learning and teaching became widespread in South Korea, while North Korea came under Russian influence. The current education system in South Korea is based on the education law promulgated in 1948. It was revised in 1998 and with added amendments now governs all matters relating to school and higher education in South Korea. The medium of instruction is Korean, but English is a compulsory subject from middle school onward. With the emphasis on globalization, English was introduced as a subject in the third year of elementary schools in 1997 and is taught for two hours a week. In North Korea, Russian was the only foreign language taught until the mid-1960s. In 1964, English was given the status of a first foreign language along with Russian. Its status was strengthened in the 1970s, and the language was introduced in the fourth grade of primary school in 1985. Very few studies are available on the status, characteristics, and functions of English in South Korea and they are practically non-existent in North Korea. Wow! Now I know that English came a long way from the post-Korean War to becoming a compulsory subject to both North and South Korea. Correct! Now that you've learned about its history, let's proceed to the characteristics. According to Shim 1999, the English textbooks being used in middle and high schools already exemplify the results of spontaneous codification of Korean English. Although the professed objective of ELT in Korea is based on the American English model, the language embodied in the English textbook and reference material examined by Shim differs from the model in three important respects. Under the category of lexico-semantic differences, First, growth as a countdown. For example, hills and valleys covered with fresh green growths. Second, after all, to mean finally. Third, to do with, to indicate endure. For example, do you think I can do with an insolent man like him? And lastly, make it, to denote attack. The wolf made straight to the travelers. Under morphosyntactic differences, first, definite article like the, presented as an obligatory marker of specificity that must precede the head noun of a relative clause or a noun in a prepositional phrase, thus rendering a grammatical sentence ungrammatical for Korean English users. For example, he is a man who can help the police. And lastly, non-count or mass nouns are used as count nouns. For example, a hard work and a great patience. Pragmatic differences. These are exemplified by the use of expressions. For example, why don't you? As a suggestion or direction in polite conversation and questions such as what are you to ask what profession do you belong to? That's quite interesting. I want to learn more. Okay, now let's talk about its Englishization. As you can see, English has affected the sole official national language, Korean, at all levels of language from phonetics to style choice. Let's trace back to its development through the history of scripts in Korea. Are you familiar with hanta? Hanta? Hanta is a traditional Chinese-derived script used by Koreans usually the scholars and elite, during the 5th century AD. But later on, King Sejong invented an alternative writing system in the 15th century, called Hangul, the current writing system used by Koreans. 
but still, Hancha was preferable by some because Hangul was associated with the uneducated women and children. Until a movement to replace the Chinese characters with Hangul by purists who were in favor of preserving the Korean identity of the language and the writing system happened. This movement system unwittingly made it possible for English as a dominant language in the post-Korean War era to make inroads into Korean. The Englishization thus introduced had effects at the levels of script and phonology and beyond. Let's discuss a part of its phonology. Since word final fricatives are disallowed by Korean phonology, the English word bus would occur pos in Korean English more than the traditional bes. While final vowel ellipses in Korean words may occur in ordinary conversational speech, they always appear in deliberate speech, while with borrowed forms such as pos, the final vowel that would conform to the Korean phonological rule does not appear. Thus, the phonological constraints of Korean have been expanded under the apparent influence of English. Further, the number of English loanwords used by Koreans is increasing steadily, and the script used for these loanwords has changed from Hangul to the Roman script. In morphology and syntax, notice the plural marker dul used by Koreans. It was formerly used with an object nominal to indicate that the prodropped subject was plural. It may now also be used to mark object plurals in a way that would be regarded as redundant according to the pre-English influenced Korean grammar. However, dul is still prescriptively considered incorrect, despite the increasing use. Code switching with English is also becoming more common. For example, ilgop simyen not bad ya, or seven o'clock is not bad. And lastly, advertising copy in Korea, some advertisements contain entire paragraphs in English which are not transliterated or translated as in the following. Crown super dry will take you into the new world with the taste of cleanness. English and Korean advertising is now a major medium of expression in product names as well as attention getters. Thank you, Gizzy, for teaching me Korean English. Now let's go back to the airport and head to China. Wow, we just landed here in China. I can't wait to tour the country and learn their culture. Oops, I guess the airplane food is not enough. Hey, Kizzy. What's the most popular dish in the Chinese cuisine? It is hot pot, also known as soup food or steamboat. It is a Chinese cooking method prepared with a simmering pot of soup stock at the dining table, containing a variety of East Asian foodstuffs and ingredients. Cool! Let's go to the nearest restaurant and eat authentic Chinese cuisine. Kizzy, I was wondering, since China invaded countries in the past, was China once invaded by another country? Yes, Donna. The Qing of Joseon Dynasty once invaded China in the winter of 1636, and the Chinese English marked history by the following year. Wow, I can't believe such a country like China was invaded. Tell me more about the history of Chinese English. Sure. It was in 1637 when the British traders brought English in China, specifically in Hong Kong, Macau, and Guangzhou or Canton. Ooh, it wasn't only that goods were traded but also language. Tell me more, Kizzy. Since then, Chinese Pidgin English became the lingua franca for traders of the Great Britain and the Chinese during the 17th century. As they traded and used the lingua franca, Chinglish became the combination of the Chinese culture and English language. Now this is getting interesting. Can you tell me more about the Chinglish? Chinglish is the combination of the Chinese culture and the English language. It is different from the normative English in all linguistic levels, including phonology, lexicon, and syntax. 
I see. Let's start with the phonology. Various vowel qualities do not exist in Chinese. As a result, there is no contrast between the two sounds for Chinglish speakers in the phonological level. For example, cheap and chip would have the same pronunciation. Wow, it is really easy, Kizzy. To put it simply, the Chinglish simplifies everything on its phonological level. That's right, Donna. I want to learn more, Kizzy. What about the lexicon? At the lexical level, Chinese English manifests itself through many ways, such as transliteration and loan translations. Oh, I know a bit about that. I heard that transliteration has brought many interesting words and expressions from the Chinese language into English. Right! Speakers are able to merge the two because of pinyin, a Latin alphabet used to write Chinese. Do you like coffee, Donna? I usually drink latte, but there are days that I crave for mocha. Huh? Wait, what's with the random question, Kizzy? Transliteration is mostly used for brands, names, or nouns that if described using Chinese words would be too long. And coincidentally, latte and mocha do not have Chinese words, and so transliteration is used to give them an equivalent Chinese name, often called a loan or borrowed word. I don't think I'm following, Kizzy. Can you elaborate it? Sure. As what I've said, latte and mocha do not have Chinese words. Latte becomes na tie, and mocha is mocha. The characters na and tie have no connection to coffee, but if literally translated, would produce to hold iron. Similarly, mocha would produce rub card, or something equally bizarre. Of course, context is often key with transliteration words. Which is why, in a non-coffee shop environment, you might clarify your meaning by adding the word coffee or cafe. I think I'm getting the gist. That's good, because there's more to it. In loan translations, there are Chinese words that could be translated directly into English. This is common for compound nouns like red bean, bean curd, and teacup. I see, but one question, Kizzy. Where do those words come from? These words come from the Chinese culture and are ideas, thoughts, or expressions that do not exist in English. For example, spring rolls would otherwise not have a meaning in English if not for Chinglish speakers making it a loan translation to describe the food. In addition, speakers use subordinate conjunctions differently and also exhibit copula absence in their speech. For example, because I am ill, so I can't go to school. Or, the dress, beautiful. It is really different from normative English, but an English speaker would still be able to understand what they are saying. Correct! In fact, Chinese grammar does not distinguish between definite and indefinite articles, so Chinese speakers struggle with when to use or not use the English definite article, the. For example, You're beautiful. You saw the beauty. You are so annoying. You saw the annoying. The Chinese also use the word the as a filler word, like how English speakers use a or um. Syntactically, the Chinglish dialect is heavily influenced by the Chinese language. The main structure and sequence of sentences in the Chinglish dialect comes from Chinese speakers. In the English language, the main sentence sequence is subject, predicate, object, adverbial. For example, the girl walked to school slowly. While the Chinese language, the main sentence sequence is subject, adverbial, predicate, object. For example, the girl slowly walked to school. This sentence structure proves that Chinese speakers leave the important information to the end of the sentence, whereas English speakers tend to present the most important information at the front. Also, the Chinese language does not contain the word it, 
causing Chinglish to use the name of the object repeatedly. For example, in English, it is on the bench, while in Chinese, banana on bench. Thank you, Kizzy. It was fun learning about the Chinese English. Oh, I'm already here. This restaurant looks promising. I can't wait to try authentic Chinese cuisine. You're welcome, Donna. You should also try Dou Sha Bao, or the red bean bun. It's the most popular Chinese dessert. I will. And now we're back in the Philippines. Thank you for accompanying me in my adventure to Japan, Korea, and China. That was fun. Now, I can pass my report about the East Asian Englishes. Until next time, bye!